my great, 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 great grandfather, John Sutton, was a white slave owner in Florida. My great, 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 great grandmother was one of the slaves he owned. In John's will, he described her as his mulatto slave Lucy, aged about 45. But the will also set Lucy free, as well as Lucy's eight children and her six grandchildren, down to the 14-month-old toddler, Mahalo. Now, I'd heard something about the will through family stories way back in the 80s when machines called typewriters <laughs> had an insertable cursive font. It seems some relative of mine had gone to the clerk in Polk County in southern Illinois and typed up what they thought was important from the copy of the will that was recorded there, the names and the ages of my freed ancestors who'd made their way to Illinois in 1846. The excerpt also said that the original was recorded in Duval County, where Jacksonville is the county seat. And some other clever relative of mine had thought it was important to include that typed up excerpt in a program book that for a family reunion that I attended in Chicago in 2001. Like a lot of black people, I always felt sort of cut off from my history by slavery. But these reunions are a way of trying to make these connections reconnect once again. Well, after I saw that excerpt of that will, I kept thinking about it and stewing over it, and I wanted to I guess I kind of needed to track it down somehow. I had hints of my family's past, but there was a, a whole lot I just didn't know. I tried unsuccessfully to find the will once before, but in 2014, my great aunt Viola was turning on 100. She's the matriarch of our family, and I was determined to find that will in time for my aunt Viola's 100th birthday celebration. Now, by profession, I am a trust and estates litigator. <laughs> <laughs> Have been for 25 years. That means I know a bit about wills, and it also means I had access to a directory of some of the best estate lawyers across the country. So on the Wednesday before I was going to Centralia, Illinois, for Great Aunt Viola's birthday, I left messages about the will at two different law firms that I knew of in Jacksonville. The first message back came from a lawyer who said that the great fire of Jacksonville in 1901 destroyed all the court records and you're not going to find anything at all. But the next message was from a paralegal at another law firm. I had told her that I knew about the fire and I knew that I wasn't expecting to find anything. And then we chatted about how what I was really trying to do was find this thing for my great aunt's 100th birthday. And the paralegal, Anne was her name. She and I must have connected over that moment, because she said she was going to try and see what she could do about finding that will. By the end of that day, I got an email from Ann that she had tracked down a John Sutton will file. They weren't sure if it was the right John Sutton, but they would have it by Friday of that week. Friday! This is like a week before I'm going back to Centralia for my great aunt's on his birthday. And that Friday morning when I got to the office, what did I get? The first thing I turned on was a message from Ann. We've got it. It is the right John Sutton. It's the right file. So I called her right back. And when she asked me what to do, I didn't know what to do. I was flabbergasted. I said, take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what she did. And that's what I got. A clean, digital image of the two-page document in beautiful brown cursive script on sepia paper, a still bright red wax seal to close the envelope. Now I have to digress for a moment to tell you that my life partner, Jeffrey, who's out there somewhere, <laughs> had been a practicing Buddhist for 20 years before I met him in 2010. And in the time that I'd known him, I'd gotten used to him chanting twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And I supported his practice, but raised a question, I really never got into that whole chanting thing. <laughs> well, one day after I found that, images of the will, I felt mysteriously compelled to join Jeffrey for his morning gong yo. Nam yo renge kyo, nam yo renge go, nam yo renge kyo. Now the chant goes on and it includes a prayer for enlightenment from your ancestors back seven plus generations. And I can't tell you exactly what happened that day, but I knew. I knew like I know that Jeffrey likes the winter because 
I come to bed with cold hands and cold feet, and he tends to run a little, run a little hot, and so cold hands and good. And I knew, like, I know that when my daughters gave me these rainbow couplings that I'm wearing as a Father's Day gift, that they were expressing to me that they love the father that I am as much as the father that I always thought I was supposed to be for them. I knew in that same way that John and Lucy were there with us that day. They were talking to me. They were trying to communicate something to me. I didn't quite understand what it was, but they told me to keep digging, to keep looking. And when we were finished chanting, I told Jeffrey about it. He took it in stride. That's the way the mystic law works. <laughs> Well, after that, I was determined to see the will for myself. So when an estate lawyer's conference was scheduled for Florida, I insisted to Jeffrey that we had to go to see that will. The impulse from my ancestors was compelling me to go. Now, deciding to drive to Jacksonville as long as I was going to be in Florida at Marco Island made sense until I looked at a map and realized that it's impossible for any two cities to be further apart than Marco Island in the south and Jacksonville in the north. <laughs> so Jeffrey set out, Jeffrey and I set out on our five and a half hour trek. And it seemed like the further north we drove, the further down south we got. <laughs> <laughs> and when we arrived at the courthouse, two obviously citified gay guys, <laughs> one black, one white, in our jaunty fedoras, <laughs> we noticed some people were looking at us suspiciously, like we were there to start some kind of shift. Now this was March of 2015, and it wasn't until later that we discovered that Duval County was one of two counties in Florida that refused to issue any marriage licenses at all, rather than is issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples in pre-marriage equality Florida. <laughs> we later concluded that we must have looked like a couple of activists coming to demand our rights to marry or something. But we made it through security, and once we got through and deep in the bowels of the probate records department, we squabbled with clerks who claimed they didn't know what file we were talking about until finally I was handed a small red well file about the size of a lady's clutch purse. My hands trembled as I undid the elastic band around the file. The inside seemed to glow with the mystery of the secrets that were captured in time. When was the last time anyone had touched the file? I pulled out the four dozen or so pages that were the probate file of John Sutton. The envelope that the will had been in was frayed and ragged but I recognized that red wax seal from the photos. Jeffrey videotaped me nearly hyperventilating because I took the wheel into my hands. I placed my finger on the X that my fourth great grandfather had made. And as I sat in the basement of the file room of the courthouse in Duval County, Florida, I expected to but didn't cry. I was too intrigued about what all this other stuff was in the file. <laughs> as, as I scanned over the documents, I knew exactly what I was holding. Flipping through the 44 pages, I whispered to Jeffrey, oh my God, the will was contested. And John Sutton had a brother named Shadrach. Shadrach? <laughs> <laughs> Who names a kid Shadrach? <laughs> And Shadrach claimed that John was too old or too crazy to make the will. Shadrach even claimed that John had been plied with ardent spirits to make him drunk, so he'd set my ancestors free. Shadrach even went so far as to claim that Lucy's kids weren't John's kids, which was a funny thing for Shadrach to claim, since the will didn't say that Lucy's kids were John's kids. But I also found in the file the handwritten notes of probate judge 
William F. Crabtree. I'm not making that up. <laughs> <laughs> now, he presided over the trial and summarized the witness's testimony, including that of the drafting lawyer Gregory Yale. And Yale testified that Lucy had been afraid of falling into Shadrach's hands because Shadrach had constantly threatened to whip, him, whip them if he ever came to own them. Mystically almost, Lucy expressed her dread across the ages, even though she would have been barred from testifying herself because of her race. I learned from the lawyer's testimony that John had been too sick to travel to meet him in town. Yale had spoken with John's sons. Yes, he called them his sons, not his slaves. And they told Yale that they'd moved to Florida from Georgia, believing that John could emancipate them and they could live free there in Florida. But once they arrived, they discovered a law barring emancipation of slaves in Florida. So Yale drafted the will to deal with that. He wrote it so that if the will were ever challenged, that the executor, William Adams, would own Lucy and the family outright, with total control over them. My ancestor John Sutton trusted Adams implicitly and explicitly to get his family to freedom, which Adams ultimately did. The same year John died, just months after the will was written. And at the bottom of the file, I found Judge Crabtree's final decree, signed on Wednesday, March 10, 1847, 170 years ago, overruling Shadrach's contest, upholding the will, and ordering Shadrach to pay court costs of $28.08. <laughs> and the will, that will that said also that after John died, everything John owned was to be sold so that Lucy and her family could afford to travel to a free state like Ohio or Indiana or Illinois, which is exactly where they ended up. Reading the will from beginning to end, I learned that John did not identify any white family at all. No widow situation, anything like that. And any decent estate lawyer knows that if you do a will right, you make sure you include any family that ever existed. So I knew, really for the first time, that John and Lucy had made a family together in a place and a time where it was illegal for the two of them, a white man and an enslaved woman, to do so. I realized that my ancestors worked hard to try to create the life they wanted. They just wanted to love to be loved. And three months after Jeffrey and I went to see the will, the Supreme Court upheld marriage equality. So if we choose to, Jeffrey and I can do what my ancestors John and Lucy never could do. They had to go around the law. We face oppressive laws now. New ones every day. Sometimes it feels like we're moving backwards instead of forwards. But what I've figured out is that I stand on the same arc of history with my ancestors, John and Lucy. And the future of my descendants yet to come is on that same arc too. And it's up to each of us, you and me, us together, to figure out what we're doing to make sure that we are resisting oppression and that we are bending that arc towards justice.